Welcome to Portsmouth This Week. It's been well over a year since our last show due to the pandemic. Many of you will remember a familiar face, Doug Smith. Doug was the host of Portsmouth This Week for well over 300 episodes. This entire series was actually his idea over eight years ago. Sadly, we lost Doug just prior to COVID. He will be greatly missed. Among many wonderful things everybody will remember about Doug, he will always be known as the standard bearer of this show. My name is Conley Zani, and I've been asked to take Doug's chair. It is a big seat to fill. I am a leadership and organizational development consultant, and my work takes me all over the world. But when I am in Portsmouth, I'm a community builder. I was a guest on this show a few years ago in my capacity as the president of the Common Fence Point Improvement Association, and I fell in love with this team and what they're trying to do here. This is community building. This show is the voice of the town, and it's an opportunity to have conversations with the people that make up the fabric of our magical, magical town of Portsmouth. It is an honor to introduce to you today my first guest, Rich Rayner. He is our town administrator. Rich, welcome to the show. Well, first off, congratulations. Well, thank you very <laughs> much. Aboard. Thank you for being the very first guest. And I, I know you've been in the role for at least five years. Six years now. Six years. Yeah. And when we got to talk last week, you said, actually, as you were coming on in your role, you watched several episodes of this show, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. It, it's, I'll just condense the story real short. Uh, bottom line is I was retiring from the Navy. I was overseas. I was in Europe. And it was getting closer to crunch time. Had to decide where we were going to go. I was looking for uh, a post-Navy career. Uh, this opportunity came up. Uh, and to do my background research on Portsmouth and to yeah. figure out exactly what it is they were looking for and what issues were important to the folks uh, in, in this town. Uh, I stumbled upon Portsmouth this week on <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> right. and I literally watched every single posted version of uh, uh, Portsmouth this week, and I took notes. It's uh, a wealth of information. What was going on? What was important? Right. You get yeah. to, to meet everybody, right? And that's our I goal. Did. So I'm glad we're starting with you. Well, now, you. listen, we are back, back, yes. I'm putting that in air quotes, yeah, yeah. Uh, from this pandemic. And yeah. Tell me about, you know, this last year or so and the reopening of the town hall and kind of what's been on your mind and the successes and yeah. challenges. It's, I, I can remember it like it was yesterday uh, when uh, we got the word that, okay, it's now serious. I was uh, in a meeting with the school administrator. Uh, he got a call from Ride. Um, we knew something big was coming and we had to take action so I immediately uh, went in a town hall I gathered the entire staff and uh, uh, the emergency management director and uh, we immediately started implementing some procedures um, and some policies uh, regarding how we were going to attempt to react and, and uh, help people through COVID um, it's it was it was a long ride um, there was a lot of work. I mean, there's no instruction manual. Uh, very, very few people uh, are alive today that lived through the Spanish flu epidemics or pandemic. Um, so it's not like we could pull something off a shelf and say, right. this is how, What's th the playbook? Th this is what you do. <laughs> right, right. Um, so much uncertainty, right? So we, we, uh, we tried to figure out uh, and do the best we can. It was long hours, seven days a week. So, I mean, it was right after that meeting with the superintendent, I got the whole staff together and we discussed, you know, what was going to happen in town, what we figured was going to happen and what we would need to do. Um, and then very shortly after that, I got a call from the governor's office. Uh, I wasn't even in town. I raced back to Portsmouth and it's just been 100 miles an hour ever since. Um, and I think what we were attempting to do was, you know, preserve as much. We, nobody knew how bad this was going to get. Right preserve as much life as we could in Portsmouth, keep it from becoming uh, a crisis that would stop the town from functioning, uh, which also meant that on top of dealing with the pandemic and all the issues that come with that, um, you know, figuring out who our seniors are, where are the seniors, um, food banks, 
dealing with people that uh, are losing their jobs, dealing with businesses that were shutting down, trying to keep restaurants open, all those things that people were looking to us for uh, to, to for provide answers. some support you know support for yeah. uh, the regular function of government still had to go on um, and then uh, you had all the surprises you know uh, well now we're going to go to remote town council meetings so we right. literally found that out on you know uh, days before a council meeting an executive order was passed by the right. governor and <laughs> said like, okay figure it out right like um, with 24 hours notice you know, right? so uh, but we did um, and it's been a it's Everybody, not just town hall, but everybody in town, everybody in the region had to figure out how to carry on with the restrictions that were put in place. Mask wearing, social distancing, closing town hall. Um, I know that people question that. Um, we don't have the luxury of a depth, of, we, we don't have a, a, a bench of players that we can call in. And right. my biggest fear throughout this pandemic was uh, if somebody in town hall gets sick, we all see each other every single day. Right. We're in each other's offices. It takes out the whole place. Immediately, I right. would have had to shut down town hall, uh, and that just wasn't an option. Right. So we shut, just like most of the other town halls in, this, in the state, we closed town hall, not because we were trying to deny people service, but because we were trying to maintain service to the right. community. Um, and we were able to do that. Yes. Um, and we only had uh, are in order for that. No, I said, well, I think it's everybody adhered to uh, the policies, the restrictions that we put in place, mask wearing, social distancing. Um, and while it was a little tougher maybe for some people to get the services from town hall that they wanted, nobody was denied. And we, we put measures in place to make it easier. For instance, the transfer station sticker. You know, normally you got to buy those in January. You had till April 30th to buy them this year. So we tried to make it as easy as possible. Everywhere where we could cut people slack, we did. Um, and uh, all towards yeah. an eye of how do we make it better. You had and to get creative, it sounds like. Constantly, and it yeah. wasn't, uh, it, it was a team effort. Uh, yeah. Kudos to all the department heads and the staff and the volunteers especially. We could not have done it without the volunteers. The food bank. Right. Um, trying to establish a food bank and trying to get that stood up. And yes, we received critics, uh, but every time Sounds we like received a critic, do. there's always somebody we always out there, do. Right? But yeah. what, I, what, what I would like people to understand is, you know, we take that very serious. When when there is a critic, and when there is uh, constructive criticism, uh, the very first thing we do is we take that on board. And okay, this is valid. How do we make it better moving forward? Right. And that's all we can do. I can't rewind the clock. Uh, but I can make it better going forward. Uh, right. And that, that's how we weather the storm. Town Hall is open now. That's um, my understanding, right? So yeah. I can go in you can and go see in. all my favorite people. You can come in and see your favorite <laughs> people. It's absolutely no issue. I mean, it, we do. We try to make it the experience better. So when you come into Town Hall now, there's a reception desk, there's a receptionist. Yeah. That receptionist will guide you to the right office. Right. So you're, uh, you're not wandering around town hall, you know, are you my key master, are you my key master, right. you know, trying to figure out where to go. Uh, this person will help I you. like that reference. And <laughs> we have, uh, it's a small town hall, yeah. uh, we have open offices, so what we did do is uh, we do ask that if you have business on the second floor, uh, you know, the, the wastewater um, planning office, my yeah. office, yeah. finance building. office, HR office, the yeah. building. Uh, just check in with the receptionist so she can call ahead yeah. uh, because those offices are open and it, it it was an issue prior to COVID. People would wander into people's offices and uh, there's there's things there that just should not yeah. be uh, uncontrolled. Right, we're still being cautious uh, and it's just as, as we should. You know, we don't have plastic barriers up there. People's desks don't sit behind a wall. So it's just the right thing to do, and, and that's the right. only measure that we put in place post-pandemic, but everything right. else is open. Well, I've been once, and it looks like everybody is still working just as hard as they have been this whole past year. It's they have. quite it's, incredible. Yeah, we couldn't have done it without yeah. dedicated folks that so, really do care about Portsmouth. So let's talk a little bit about some of the recent work. Oh, I shouldn't even say recent. I want to yeah. talk about the budget, and sure. that's not even, I know we've been talking about it recently, but... This yeah. budget process started almost a year ago, right? Yes, I mean, it's, it, to me, it's uh, you know past an opening now. Uh, we have a budget; it went into effect July first. Okay, all uh, right. But to put it in perspective, 
uh, I have already had some of my first budget meetings. It's only, what, the 9th of July. Right. I've already had my first budget meetings with some department heads. Okay. So as soon as, you, as soon as you publish an adopted budget, you start on the next one. Right. Uh, you know, and during the budget hearings uh, and that whole process leading up, the emails, the phone calls, the texts, the, the comments at town, ha town hall, the comments at meetings, the tom comments during the public hearings, those are all taken on board. And we do try to make it better every single year. And to right. put it in perspective, the year before I arrived in 2005, July 1st, 2015, the budget was 30 pages long. The it's budget, over 100 now, it's right? It's well, well north of 100 pages. Be and why is that? Did you bring it? No, I didn't no, bring it. No, you didn't it bring it It was because in the every time somebody <laughs> says, we need to be more transparent, and we would like to see this in the budget. OK, we'll right. do that. Of course we'll right. do that. And it's easily accessible on the town's website. It's right? on the town's yes. website. You can come into town. It's, it, we try to make it as accessible as possible. I mean, right. it, nobody's trying to hide anything. Absolutely. It's a difficult process because you, you're constantly trying to balance uh, all these stakeholders uh, and camps of thought that have their desires and their wishes to be uh, adhered to with respect to the budget process. So you have uh, the people that want to keep taxes low. You have the people that don't care about the taxes. You have the people that want to uh, concentrate on a certain issue. You have the people that want to concentrate on uh, spending less, hiring less, hiring more. So it's got, it's a balancing it's act. It's hard to make everybody happy. Entire, and that's the hardest part. I don't know that is, anybody could do that. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but to, again, another perspective point, um, you know, when we have our budget hearings, with the exception of this last one, which really had nothing to do with the budget per se, um, you, generally most people seem to be pretty happy. Um, you know, they have comments, uh, you know, it, there's always the person that's going to find the typo. There's always the person that's going to find, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a placeholder cell that did not get combined with another cell in the end product. Um, that happens, and we're very grateful that people are looking at it. It tells me that people, people are paying attention to what we do, and that's what we want. Yeah, so it's been a long process. A yeah. transparent process. If I want to give feedback on the budget, I have many opportunities to do that. You do. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, obviously there's four nights of budget hearings, and then there's the the public hearing. Uh, but there's not a single counselor that isn't accessible. Our finance director is accessible. I'm accessible. Pick up the phone, text, email, come by town hall, request an appointment. Um, we're happy to hear. Uh, right. We want to do it better. There's not a single person working for the town or representing the town that wakes up in the morning thinking, gee, I wonder how I can make this job worse. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, right. Make people know, more mad at me. <laughs> it, it's tough. And, and, and you walk into work in the morning, and, and generally, I mean, you, it's, it's just an understanding. When you walk in a town hall as a citizen, you're either there to pay a fine, or you're paying a, a fee, or you're, you have to talk to the tax assessor. To, most of the time, you're probably not in the happiest mood when you come there. Right. Uh, we just want to make it better for you, right. um, you know, right. and, and try to do what the council, the charter, our laws and our ordinance tell us we have to, what we have to do. I yeah. Try to adhere to that. Yeah. yeah. So I looked at the budget, and yeah. I, there's a giant chunk of change going toward maintaining our buildings and improving them and everything. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the processes that um, you and the council have gone through to just make that really yeah. transparent and, and um, analytical and data-driven? Yeah, it, it's, it goes back to uh, when I first arrived, uh, we as a staff and as a council decided that we needed a more robust capital improvement plan. So one of the very first things we did is we commissioned uh, an engineering firm, an assessment firm, to survey all the town buildings. We have that, the Jacobs Report, and that is included in our uh, long-term capital request plan. There are, s but there's much more need than there is the ability to pay for it. And then you have to make priorities in, in your spending plan, in the ultimate budget. Um, we we could spend the entire budget just 
trying to repair some of the damage or some of the disrepair that has happened over decades. We're making strides, but there are going to be ch difficult choices that have to be made in right. the future. You know, does it, I, I like to use this as an example, and I don't mean to offend anybody. We have a sheep shed, does it, and it's falling down. Does it really make sense, you know, to spend tens of thousands of dollars to rebuild a sheep shed? I, I don't Where's know. Where's the sheep shed? I don't uh, it's in the Glen, it's Glen Park. Oh, is it? Okay, <laughs> all right. I don't but get I mean, over there very but often. I but use that as an example, so and again, it's not meant to, it's not meant to yeah. offend anybody, but the amount of capital uh, that we are responsible for uh, dwarfs most towns of comparable size. Most towns have a town hall, uh, maybe a public works building or a shed, and maybe a public safety building, and then whatever schools they have. It, we have so much more. We have the Glen Manor House. We have all the parks buildings. We have um, uh, the Brown House. Uh, there's so much that we have to take care of. We have a, an old boat house. Uh, there, there's so much that needs to be addressed. And so we, we captured all that information from the Jacobs Report. We put it into the Capital Improvement Plan. We addressed the Capital Improvement Plan with the Council very early in the budget process. We try to do that every year. And then based on their input and their suggestions, then we develop a prioritized spending plan. And that's, that's where we go, with all with an eye towards you know, catching up and then getting ahead of where we need to be with respect right. to the, the care and feeding of our buildings. Yes, absolutely. So w one of the interesting topics around town right now. I know where you, you're going. Do you know where <laughs> I'm going? I keep seeing these signs, save the Portsmouth Senior Center. And um, I, would, I would really like to understand from your perspective, I'd like to hear sure. um, a little bit of your take on all of that. Um, it was my understanding that the Senior Center is their own 501c3 organization. Like they are a separate entity that the town I know um, gives money to through civic support Correct. every year. But they are fully run by their own board and there's an executive director. Um, and, and so it's, um, it's a delicate balance to strike because the, the council can vote to give money, but then they can't tell, they, they have no control over how that money is spent. Is, is that right? Or am I, maybe teach me something here. No, that's <laughs> essentially correct. It's, okay. Uh, okay. It, they're a private nonprofit organization, the Portsmouth Senior Center. Okay. And, and I, I think what has happened here is, first off, there's a conflation of two separate issues. There's the Portsmouth Senior Center, which is an organization that caters to the Portsmouth seniors, and not just Portsmouth seniors, but seniors in the region. You know, so you have right. many other uh, municipalities who are represented in their, in their membership. That's a private nonprofit organization. They do get civic support. This, uh, we, we always give them what they ask for. This year they asked for $80,000. That was given to them, no questions asked. Have we, is that consistent with what we've done in the past? Yeah, it's actually gone down a little bit. Uh, I think due to COVID, their, their expenses went down. I, I suspect that's what drove it, and they, they asked for a little less. Okay. Also, on top of that, now you have, it's, it's like a Venn diagram, but then you have the Ann Hutchinson Building, which is the old school in which they are housed. So you have a private nonprofit who is resident the only resident in the Ann Hutchison building. Which is a Portsmouth building. That is a Portsmouth owned town building. Okay. Leased to the Portsmouth Senior Center for a dollar a year. Okay, all now right. Now that building, this is what it really revolves around. That building needs a lot of work. A lot of the argument around the building or concern around the building is the fact that because it is not sprinkled, they cannot use the main gathering areas. There's a, like a ballroom area and then the area where, um, uh, like a cafeteria. The rest of the building to the north of that is still open for use. It's still so office know, space. And yes, and we were able to work that with uh, the state authorities to keep that open. Well, let me stop you there. So this was a state fire marshal decision. Is yes, that correct? Because I think that's very yeah, important. It's, it's much more nuanced than that. Okay. 
there was a request um, by the uh, Portsmouth Senior Center to have the building assessed by the state fire marshal. The state fire marshal assessed that building and found uh, numerous, numerous code violations. How long ago? Uh, it, it, all the time. This is all on it's top all of blur. COVID, on top of a budget. I, yeah. uh, two but, years, I think. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to like. No, no. It's, it's, I'm just it's, curious. It's right? all a blur. Because I'm also feeling like there's some people out there that feel like this is brand new. No. This, the, the issues with the building have been known for, for, for well over a decade. Oh, okay. And there were restrictions placed on the use of the building by the Portsmouth Fire Marshal. Okay. Those were not adhered to. That drove That's interesting. this situation where the state fire marshal assessed the building and on top of storage in the second floor, which was not allowed but was being done, and use of the second floor, they found many other violations that had to be addressed. Long story short, we tried to address those problems, but there were some problems, particularly with uh, to do with the structure. Sprinkling the building, uh, the height of the doors, ADA compliance, elevator, um, emergency exits. None of these met code, but all would have to be implemented right. to keep using it in the way it right. was. You can't do one without the other. And that is, right. that's the crux of it. So yes. there, there is a belief that, well, we'll just go in and sprinkle the building and everything will be fine. Not no, true. that's just not true. Right. Uh, once you start, you, you, you can't be, the glass can't be half full. Once you start, you've got to fill that whole glass. So, that's right. And so then, I think I'm that's just, I just, misunderstood. I, I think that's misunderstood right. in our town. There are a lot of people that are like, we've got the money for the sprinklers. We can fix that. But you are saying emphatically that that is not the, the rules. Yeah, and it, it gets a little bit more involved, but this is where you start losing people, and then they start telling you, be quiet, I'm not talking to you, right. and they get very rude. Because it's just that hard. Yeah. But, the, yeah. but the, the crux of it is, while this was all starting to come to a head, we had to decide, how are we going to keep this building open? At the same time, the council had directed me to start looking at a possible uh, Portsmouth, based on the results of the community survey that was done right before all this happened, I remember that. they would they wanted to know what are the possibility of and how much would a uh, community uh, center cost and where would we put it? Okay, that's all happening at the same time. This is blowing up at the same time. COVID's happening at the same time. Everything else is happening. <laughs> we did that study and we stopped it because the result, we got some preliminary drawings, three possible locations. The most obvious choice from the architectural point of view was the Ann Hutchinson building. Okay. So at the same time that that's happening, we had to go before the state fire marshal board and we had to state, it was like, being, it was like little kids being, you know, they're all sitting up there and, and you're sitting there in a seat, look, a little kid going to the principal's office. And we had to tell the state fire marshal or the, the, the board what it was that we intended to do with this building. Well, we wanted to fix it, but we knew we didn't have the money to fix it. And at the same time, the council was interested in a community center. So I answered, we, we it was like rolling a dice. We had absolutely no idea whether they were going to force us to shut it down right away or give us more time. How much more time? So in, a, in conference with the state fire, and this is a board, so in conference with the state fire marshal, the Portsmouth fire marshal, and the fire chief, we decided that we would ask for June 30th, 2021. We felt that that wasn't biting too much of a bite at the apple and that there would be other decisions that would be made that might make this whole thing moot. So I made the comment that based on the events at the time and the context of what we were dealing with at the time, I stated that the building would probably be uh, demolished and with the intent that we would replace it with a community center. But right. um, so now it's out in the public eye that, oh God, you know, the town administrator wants to demolish the Ann Hutchins building. Absolutely yeah. not. As a Absolutely matter of fact, the drawings not. that we got 
were a community center with an integrated senior center that had their own private spaces separate from the community center in these right. conceptual drawings. So that all went by the wayside very shortly after that because the town decided, the council decided they wanted to do a master plan. So we've now started the master plan. So in the meantime, it's like, well, we can't shut down the, the senior center. What can we do? We go back to the state board. All right, how can we keep the building open? Review it again. We can keep the north end of the building open. And then we presented the Portsmouth Center, Senior Center, which is, which is an organization, not a building. We presented them with some of our options, our ideas, none of which were palatable to the organization uh, for reasons that are probably all valid. Uh, a meantime that we go together with the senior, uh, Middletown Senior Center, um, renting spaces, common fence points, so on and so forth. But uh, we're, we are where we're at right now. I'll, I'll wrap it up real quick. Nobody wants to shut them down. Everybody is working their hardest to come up with a solution that is good for everybody. And I'll just leave it there. It is absolutely clear that that is, that is what you are trying to do. And thank you for coming. I, I think we could have several more shows sure. with you um, just to for, further explore this. And I'm actually hoping the Senior Center might come as well. So we're wrapping up right now. My name is Conley Zani. It has been an honor to have our town administrator, Rich Rayner, on Ports Portsmouth this week. We'll see you next time. Okay, Captain Go. Okay. Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to the first edition of Portsmouth This Week, a weekly discussion with Portsmouth Town Administrators. Uh, we started Portsmouth This Week back in 2012 with the request of the then new town administrator, John Clem, as a means to inform Portsmouth residents of what was going on around town. Uh, Gary Gump, Rich Talipsky, and I met in John Clem's office to discuss. Uh, what we could do as volunteers to help tell people what's happening. Uh, coming to Portsmouth from Barnstable, Massachusetts, John told us that he had had a full-time TV studio in the, in the town hall uh, that was accessible to him to do use any time to tell people about uh, Barnstable what was going on. Uh, we mentioned to him that we had a local Rhode Island public access TV studio right here in Portsmouth, Peg TV, and. Uh, it aired on Cox Channel 18, so for just about anybody to see it. Uh, afterwards, we went over and talked to Brian Medeiros, the manager uh, of the PEG studio, and started to put together a, a, a team of volunteers to produce a weekly show about events, uh, organizations, and issues uh, that Portsmouth residents would be interested in. Hello again, I'm Doug Smith, and welcome to the 7 June 2019 edition of Portsmouth This Week. We'll see you next week on Portsmouth This Week.